oh, Daryl had the boxes come. Um, I'm not certain if the shirt boxes have made it yet. We haven't. I haven't gone down. Oh, okay. Chris is going to join one of our shows, right? I did not get to read that correspondence. I saw there was something going on. Okay, I'm Battle lines are drawn, and once again, somebody's saying, wait, be patient. If they knew how long it would be before all people could truly hear freedom ring. I wonder which end of that moral arc would they choose? I wonder if more would have walked in his shoes. This is what, this is what revolution looks like. You gotta get in and then stay in this fight. You've got to find a way to get in. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth session of the Good Trouble Voting Rights Institute. We are so glad to have you here today. And my name is Lynn Whitfield, and I am the director and the, um, of the Good Trouble Voting Rights Institute. And like I said, we're so glad to have you here today. Of course, today we have our uh, resident enlighteners, um, attorney Daryl Jones, who is the co-leader and the chair of the board of Transformative Justice Coalition. And of course, the founder of the Transformative Justice Coalition and the co-leader, Barbara Arnwine. But today we're also being joined by a wonderful, wonderful young person who's going to get this whole thing kicked off talking about the youth. And that is Miss Anaya Vines. She is a student at the Howard University, and she is the founder of the Live Moment. And she's got some technical difficulties, so you're not going to be able to see her beautiful face when she's talking, but you will hear from her. Please pay attention. Go right ahead, Barbara and Daryl. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome, of course, as Lynn has said, to the fourth uh, of our second semester of the Good Trouble Voting Rights Institute. We, uh, Daryl and I, are actually uh, broadcasting live from Louisiana uh, because, as everyone knows, this is the final four of the NCAA basketball tournaments. Well, there's also the HBCU all-stars game and we're so happy to be here where the transformative justice coalition is sponsoring 350 students tomorrow to be part of that game and those 350 students are coming from hbcus dillard xavier and the au complex so we are beyond happy to be part of this. And of course, Anaya Vines is amazing. She is a student youth leader. Let me be very clear of the live movement. 
uh, in the live movement is amazing and is, uh, you know, composed of, and she will tell you about these great HBCUs. So as we talk today, we're going to be going into the past. We're going to talk about the present, but we're also going to talk about the future because the youth vote is everything when we talk about 2022 and the future. So I'm gonna turn it over to my uh, great colleague, uh, Daryl Jones, to bring his greetings also. Hey, Daryl. Hey, Barbara and uh, Lynn, and thank everybody for joining us for uh, this, uh, this session of the Voting Rights Institute. You know, as Barbara said, you know, one of the things that people tend to overlook uh, is the power of the youth. In, in terms of the social movements and all that has happened throughout our country. Clearly, we know that uh, during the 60s, that it wasn't just college students uh, that were huge with regards to pushing forward with civil rights. It was also high school students uh, that were involved, couldn't even vote, but they were involved heavily with, uh, with the movement for, for civil rights and social justice issues. So you know, today, as we go through this particular session, we're gonna be highlighting a lot of the things uh, that came out of the youth movement and, and also presenting what's going on currently uh, with the youth movement uh, as we go through uh, the, the, the discussions of George Floyd, as we go through the discussions of Ahmaud Arbery, as we go through the discussions of all of this, uh, dealing with climate change, all of these issues uh, that have been put forth. But I tell you, Barbara, I could not be more excited than the many times that we have uh, gone out in the 60 or so uh, uh, motorcades, votercades that we've done, and the number of young folk that come out unexpectedly uh, to join us, many from college, many from high school. And, you know, and, and Anaya Vines is one of those people. You know, we, we, we happened up on Anaya Vines. She is already out in the streets. We encountered That's right. And so, absolutely. So just the excitement of being able to join forces with some of our, our young leaders uh, that are out there throughout the country as well as to be able to meld everyone together uh, in our quest for voting rights and social justice. It's just been uh, an, 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 you know, an incredible experience. And I look forward to getting into uh, more detail as we talk about voting and the power of the youth leadership in forging transformative change throughout our country. Barbara? Yes, I thank you so much, Daryl. And Anaya, I know that you want to say a word of introduction and welcoming. And we are just so happy that you're here today uh, assisting us in this very vital presentation. Because as I told people the other day uh, at the uh, States Women's Luncheon in Washington, D.C., as I told the hundreds, uh, the most important part of our movement is the youth movement. Uh, so, Anaya. Hello, hello, everyone. Um, Anaya Vines here. So honored to have been invited to this panel. Definitely appreciate it. Um, like Daryl said, it definitely was um, fate for us to have crossed paths. Um, it was actually um, hilarious how it happened because it wasn't supposed to like happen. We didn't plan for it to happen as crossing paths. But we just so happened to um, all be on the front lines at the same time. And um, me and my friends traveled from DC um, to Georgia actually for the Senate runoff um, for now Senate um, runoff. So it was definitely great. We saw them, they were loud, we were loud. So we ended up joining forces and sticking with them the whole day. Um, and since then, you know, they couldn't get rid of us um, and me especially. So, um, but my name is Anaya Vines. I am currently a senior at B Howard University double major political science criminology from Charlotte, North Carolina by way of Brooklyn, New York, um, an aspiring lawyer. Um, so definitely had to stick around with, with them for that, need some advice once that happens. Um, but yes, I'm also the founder and CEO of the Live Movement. I'm a national HBCU abolitionist coalition standing on the foundation that we must live for those who have died. So paying homage to those that came before us by continuing on the fight through direct action, advocacy work, um, and legislation. Um, so we're extremely big when it comes to um, students, the student movement. Historically, there has always been students on the front line. What we're trying to do is create a centralized um, organization in which students can tap in all across the nation. So when it's time for students to move, there is a platform for us to um, communicate and say, okay, we need to move now. And this is how we're going to move. Um, 
to too many times there is assumptions that students are unorthodox um, and they're chaotic and though we have passion and motivation um, we don't have structure and the live movement is here to combat those um, stereotypes and to say we do have structure we do know what we're doing though we are young we do um, have experience we do know how you know this day and age works um, and we do know how to not only organize, but strategize to push the needle forward towards Black liberation. So I'm um, definitely excited and happy to be here to speak on behalf of the students um, across the nation. All right. Well, that is so exciting because tomorrow uh, we will be greeting thousands of students uh, and thousands of just young people. I want people to be always clear. You know, I love, love, love to talk about our youth, but our youth are, you know, students and non-students. And so I'm always happy to, you know, to give all the greetings and all the joy and all the respect to the many, many young people out there who are bringing it bringing change, even as they work, even as they uh, are struggling, uh, you know, in the society uh, to, you know, to hold on to jobs or to get jobs or to quit jobs that aren't paying them well, all of these issues that are confronting our young people. I am just so happy that we're able to have this discussion. So voting and the power of youth leadership in forging transformative change. Next slide. Uh, this is a quote from former uh, President Barack Obama, and it says, young people have helped lead all our great movements. How inspiring to see it again and so many smart, fearless students standing up for their right to be safe, marching and organizing to remake the world as it should be. We've been waiting on you and we've got your backs. Well, you know, I just want to remind everybody that the best struggles worldwide have always been intergenerational because uh, in the 1960s that we're going to be talking about a lot, there was the children's crusade. That's right, children, uh, you know, as, er as young as five, uh, you know, as old as, you know, 14, you know, just doing their thing, being leaders in that movement. Next slide. Daryl? And you know, Barbara, one of the exciting pieces uh, of watching the children's movement and the movement of the, of the youth was that we know that in 2018, we had the Parkland shooting. And as a response to that Parkland shooting, we had high school uh, students in particular that then picked up the mantle of leadership and began to uh, um, organize on the issue of gun control and have gone beyond the issues of gun control. But the wonderful part of it is we had those high school students that came to Washington, D.C., and we participated in the March with the Children uh, in D.C. And, you know, to watch them emerge into their moment, to watch them grow and, and, and uh, become so, so solidified on the issues of their concern was just a phenomenal experience. And it's that type of spirit and it's that type of growth that we've seen not simply uh, coming out of the 60s, but, but now, right currently, we see that same spirit, that same issue-based focus that's coming from many students from across the country and many of our youth from across the country, Barbara. Oh, absolutely, and Anaya, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, when you saw this movement of all these hundreds of thousands of young people who came to mm -hmm. Washington, uh, for the you know the you know the demand something be done about gun violence. Uh, what was your reaction when you saw that amazing march, and how were you involved? Um, well, one thing about me being that I am of this generation, um, I'm never surprised when it comes to the youth getting engaged. I really do think that it is um, expected. Um, I think that a lot of the youth, what we really need is a certain level of motivation. And that's something that um, is a serious thing. And especially when it comes to high schoolers, um, with the type of mother that I have, I love my mom. She's a wonderful woman and the woman that I aspire to be. Um, but I also know that there is a certain level of um, fear 
when it comes to having students, your children, especially going out into the front lines, marching, especially like, you know, if it's a distance away from home. So like understanding those students want to be activated um, and those students eventually do get tapped in. Um, it usually is, um, happens in phases. Um, I know that with me, the, um, the biggest reason, the biggest, um, the biggest motivator of me going out there, my mother being okay with it, um, was because it directly affected my family. Um, in 2016, my um, cousin Delron Smalls was um, shot and killed by an off-duty police officer in Brooklyn, New York. And because of that direct impact, she understood that nothing was gonna keep me away from being on the front lines because not only was I seeing it um, on TV, not only was I hearing about it in the news or on social media, but um, I was attending a funeral of, of a loved one. So yes, when we talk about gun violence, I'm there. When we talk about you know uh, having the students on the front lines, I've always been one of those students even before you know I was in college, being in high school. Um, that was actually my first um, walkout in high school was a gun violence awareness walkout when there was um, a series of mass shootings with the one specifically in Florida. Um, I had to, you know, be a part of it. So there is phases that I understand the boundaries and certain things that parents put in the way. Um, but I do know that eventually students will always find their, their way home on the front lines. And you know, Barbara, Thanks. what I find really interesting as we go to the next slide is that we know that after 2018, going into the summer of 2020, we saw so many protests that were going on. And now we're in the midst of COVID uh, when, when this is happening. And <clears throat> as we saw issues like Anaya was just, with, uh, was just raising with gun violence or police violence, or if it's accountability, police accountability or reduction of student debt, we had these students that were coming out in numbers to protest and be certain that their voices were heard. And that also includes them coming out for voting rights, Barbara. It, it's just an incredible experience. And I know you wanted to drill down perhaps a little more on it. Well, I just wanted to uh, you know, tell people that uh, as everyone knows during the George Floyd uh, protests, there were, you know, I just wanna remember, everybody remember that in 2020, Ahmaud Arbery is killed. Uh, in February of 2020. And folks don't know about his slaying because the district attorney there, Jackie Johnson, covered it up uh, and uh, covered up the fact that he was killed by these white vigilantes out of hate. And so the video gets released in late April and folks turn on fire beginning in May. And you have your first mass protests in May. Uh, and then right thereafter comes Breonna Taylor, the you know, killing in Kentucky and that horrible slaying of that young woman as she was in her bed, innocent, uh, just uh, you know, shot on this quote, no knock warrant nonsense, this hor horrific you know, ways that we over police and over criminalize in our society. And then came George Floyd uh, in that June of that year. And so it's so important for people to know the trajectory and it was the buildup and it was the Richard Brooks and it was all the other unknown names that are you know, rarely called out. They were also being slain by police during that time. And it was our youth that again went to the streets and said, change has to come. We're not COVID or not, danger or not. We demand that we wanna live in a society that is uh, fair, that, uh, that gives us our human dignity, that is not out hunting and killing us for racial control. And that movement to this day reverberates. I don't know if people are aware, but the efforts by the young people not only help sustain the families of the slain through these crises, not only raise awareness, but they, uh, but their effect uh, has shown that even with the, uh, you know, people who have their, you know, differences over quote defund the police, that people's awareness changed a lot on racial issues. But more importantly, 
there was a lot of money poured into the sector that even white organizations, quote, progressive organizations uh, benefited but from, but a lot of black organizations are stronger today because of the uh, amazing work that Black Lives Matters did, put it on the line, the activists, there were sacrifices by activists. I don't want people to just think folks went out there and marched. A lot of people sacrificed. Some people were run over in Minnesota by haters. Uh, people were, there are missing young people that we don't know where they are now who were leaders in that movement. People committed suicide from the pain of having to deal with this you know, uh, horrible society. There were so many uh, sacrifices and martyrs. So I wanna you know, give all the props, all the respect to those amazing you know, leaders who got out there and, and argue for you know, Black Lives Matters uh, and to the officials in Raleigh and in DC and other words where people actually created Black Lives Matter streets and plazas and tried to show some respect as we had a president that was doing nothing but being adverse and wicked and evil uh, during this time. Uh, we could say so much more. Wow, this is like a presentation unto itself, but we better move on. Absolutely, Barbara. And you know, as we go to the next slide, we know that the Black Lives Movement uh, really was one of the catalysts that kicked off uh, a lot of the activities and actions and direct actions that we saw that uh, that occurred uh, across the country. And very interestingly, there was a response. You know, one of the things we always teach and talk about in this institute is not only the action that occurs, but the response to the action when it occurs. So from the Black Lives Move, uh, Matter movement and the uh, action of getting uh, Blacks and Brown people together and out in the streets, we did see a response. And one of the responses we saw was in the state of Florida, where they decided that you know they were going to criminalize uh, particularly black and brown people coming together to protest and make it a felony conviction, to put that on your record, to get, to get you uh, caught up uh, in that system. So that's one of the things that, uh, that, that's an outgrowth of that. But interestingly, and, and, un, uh, uh, you know, and certainly uh, without question, one of the responses that has come has been that the peaceful protests have continued. The peaceful assimilation to lift up issues has continued. Barbara, one of the pieces that you uh, actually raised up with the Ahmaud Arbery case and Jackie Johnson down in Georgia, we know that uh, uh, following the slaying of Ahmad, the execution uh, of Ahmad, the lynching, if you will, of Ahmad, that there was an immediate community response. There were people that were coming out and it dissipated, but you know, uh, the Arbery family along with uh, uh, the Transformative Justice Coalition and other, and other organizations all got together and worked and we were able certainly to push forward and keeping that in the news. One of the new pieces that uh, we encourage people to get their boots ready, their flags ready, their banners ready to be ready to march. Because Barbara, what what we've learned, what we've learned from uh, this trip here in uh, in New Orleans was that we've had contact with the attorneys that have been working on the grounds in Georgia, and it appears as though Jackie Johnson isn't even close to coming to trial not even close to putting her to that point. She hasn't been arraigned. So we have more work that's gonna be ahead of us. We're gonna be in the streets demanding justice, full justice for Ahmaud Arbery. And I know you wanted to drill down a little more uh, on the Black Lives Matter movement, as well as the peaceful demonstrations that are going on. Well, I, you know, I believe that, uh, you know, that people have to take direct action. And we're gonna talk about that more uh, that it's not enough to, you know, be a Twitter activist, which is important that we, mm -hmm. you know, educate each other. But as Anaya knows, it's important for people to get in the streets and to be seen and to be heard. And I just uh, love the fact that uh, during all these marches, while people were sitting, sitting around yelling about, oh, they don't understand why people are in the street, et cetera. And what about their voting? They're not voting. It was just a lie. You know, I'm just amazed at how much people lie on young people uh, because at every march that we went to, people were registering young folks to vote. They were talking about the power of the youth vote. They were uh, just, you know, preaching about how they could make, you know, change and how important it was for young people to be involved. And, uh, and if it hadn't been for that movement, uh, nothing would have happened because 
actually people may not remember, but in our first institute, I was teaching uh, about how there had been this uh, decrease in voter registration because of COVID. Uh, and that all reversed itself when the George Floyd protest started. All of a sudden, the registration, voter registration in the country went up significantly. It was largely driven by young voters vote, uh, registering for the first time, getting involved in the system. Uh, so, you know, I just don't want people to get all, you know, twisted. Young folks not showed us their multi dimensional organizing that they can organize. And, uh, you know, around several issues at the same time and register people to vote. Amazing. And you know, Barbara, uh, as we turn to the next slide and we're talking about the young people not only looking to get in the streets, but, you know, to be involved and in getting people out to vote. You know, Anaya, what has been your experience uh, as one of the leaders of the Live Movement in getting people, getting young people in particular, uh, out to vote and motivated? Yeah, so I think even before um, having created the live movement and seeing, you know, the voting rights spaces, um, I like just making sure we um, hold those accountable um, because during the seasons where, you know, we had to get young folks out to vote, um, there were a lot of organizations, I feel, and if we're like, if this, you know, being a safe space, um, not a lot of safe spaces, I think were made for young people out on the front lines. There was, I think a lot of organizations that um, use a lot of young people when it comes to um, getting people out to vote and really burn them out. And just speaking on behalf of a lot of young folks, um, there was a lot of organizations that, you know, gave, um, young folks uh, are trying to, you know, bring them into their organization to do a lot of the legwork. And then afterwards, once the election happened, um, that was it. And, you know, I feel like there wasn't a lot of, um, you know, like debriefing afterwards, trying to keep them engaged once that was done. Um, a lot of organizations came and rallied together for the um, presidential, you know, election, but afterwards, what about, you know, our local, our regional elections? Um, what about those, you know, that happen on a two-year basis? Um, so I would say, you know, a lot of the safe spaces that I found were student-led um, spaces that focused on voting rights, but when it came to um, national organizations that have to appease, you know, certain um, funders, or have to appease, you know, certain folks that are in their pockets. They, you know, had to get that um, manpower of the youth. But I feel like a lot of youth, honestly, were turned away from the movement between the years of 2020 and 2022, merely because of um, the lack of um, mental health awareness and the um, burnout, the reality of burnout that happened on the youth. Because to be completely honest, a lot of the youth were thrown into the movement in 2020. This wasn't a gradual thing, you know? This was something that we felt like it was our responsibility to tap into. Um, but because um, I think, you know, some folks had certain personal vendettas um, with it. So um, it was definitely a beautiful thing, but also just understanding that we have to make sure when it comes to those that are still developing as people, and developing in the movement, we have to be um, extra courteous with how we treat them while engaging them um, on the streets. And, you know, I, I want to pick up on that real quickly, uh, and then we'll go to the next slide, uh, because a lot of what you're talking about, about the conflict between uh, the, the big national organizations and young people's aspirations and uh, and the accountability principles all were actually issues that we saw in the 1960s. You know, I'm reading the book on Ella Baker written by Barbara Ransby, and she talks about this uh, at length. You know, and of course, Barbara Ransby's been an incredible advisor to the Black Lives Matters movement nationally, uh, but her 
take on Ella Baker, where she shows that the most important, uh, you know, creation was their, uh, you know, independence, you know, from these uh, groups. But also, I want to mention something important that during after the Trayvon Martin uh, demonstrations, I pointed out over and over to to people that uh, a lot of those leaders who were in that movement were gone within two years. Uh, and youth leaders were gone within two years that we couldn't, that they were burned out. Uh, many just dissipated, left the movement. Uh, and one thing I am very aware of and very grateful for is, is the fact that we got to start building into all of our organizing because we're fighting this monster of white you know, systemic racism, uh, which is gonna fight us and try to demoralize us, disillusion us, uh, you know, and you know, and all the mainstream uh, groups, you know, have too much investment in what is. But one thing we got to do is have trauma-informed counseling and supports because it's traumatic to be in these movements. And a lot of people get traumatized. So I was very appreciative to spend you know, last month uh, working with the truth and racial healing and transformation uh, movement uh, where they're actually building community healers and community trauma informed specialists to work alongside of activists, uh, to work alongside of people seeking change. So that's just, I'm so glad you raised that because that is so important, Anaya, uh, because if we don't, we'll see the tragedies. Remember, you know, um, in his early years, Kwame Ture had a nervous breakdown. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, whose uh, anniversary of assassination comes up on Monday, was, you know, suffered from severe depression uh, because of, you know, the repeated, you know, threats on his life, but also because of the frustrations of being in the leadership. So there's so much to talk about. And so the next slide. You know, um, we're just gonna, you know, briefly talk about the um, whole um, fight by students over the, the years uh, to bring about change. And this is just some of the history, Oberlin College, next slide. Uh, and then, you know, Oberlin's actions, um, uh, you know, in 1835, uh, uh, that when it admitted, you know, blacks and women, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which was before, by the way, the Civil War, and uh, and how it was one of the few uh, uh, colleges that understood uh, how to resist uh, the fugitive slave law and so many other things, and how they were, you know, indicted and and prosecuted by the federal government for their actions. Next slide, quickly. Um, and then, Daryl, you wanna take this one on? Because this sure, is- Sure, uh, <clears throat> Yes. Yeah, yeah, the Alexandria uh, Library sit-in actually is thought to be one of the first sit-ins uh, in the country, in, in America. And very interestingly, you know, what was happening, it was that in Alexandria, there was only one library. It was the Barrett Branch Library that was there. And it really is an example of the power of the youth because what then happens, and this is 1939, uh, what then happens is that, uh, that that library, the Barrett Branch Library, was the only library for Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, and it would not allow African-Americans to come in there and to get a library card to get books. And so Samuel Tucker, who at that time uh, was maybe 24, 25 years old, uh, went over to the uh, Baird Branch Library and he was determined uh, to get library cards. And one of the things that he did very interestingly, he was an attorney, he actually passed the bar for the state of Virginia when he was like 20 years old. Uh, but what he did was he arranged for five, uh, five, uh, five African-American men uh, to go over to get library cards. And as they were each refused, they, they went over sequentially. And as they were refused their library cards, they would go pick up a book, sit in the library and just start reading. And they stayed and they grew a crowd because people wanted to know what was going on. Why were these black men coming in so mannerly and not leaving? 
And they ended up uh, calling the police to have them arrested. And of course, Samuel Tucker represented them uh, following, uh, following their arrest. And very interestingly, because it's a ph phenomenal story. Uh, and if you have not read it, we encourage you to go deeper into the Samuel Tucker story and the Alexandra Library sit-in because they then tried to uh, uh, the press forward with the uh, resolution. Samuel Tucker was, uh, was, was ill and was uh, bedridden and the substitute counsel came in and they have attempted to have a resolution of a Plessy type of Plessy v. Ferguson type of resolution saying, we're gonna build you a separate library, don't come that And, uh, and they, uh, it was accepted by the then attorney. Of course, uh, Sam Tucker was not an attorney and he was really just really uh, livid over it because he wanted the services to be equal and use the same facilities, not separate facilities. So we encourage you to find out that story on the Alexandria Library sit-in to do a little more research on a phenomenal story, the first sit-in in America in 1939. Next slide. <clears throat> Following, okay, Barbara, this, this is your territory because you're going to North Carolina, Barbara. Hey, I mean, come on, you know, I lived in North Carolina I went, uh, for many years, went to Duke for law school, and, uh, you know, most people think I'm from North Carolina <laughs> because my North Carolina people are so good at claiming me. Much love. Um, but, of course, you know, the, uh, the Greensboro sit-in was one of the most uh, publicized of all of the sit-ins. And, um, and people don't know that, you know, that there had been, you know, remember there was a Montgomery boycott uh, in 1954 that really set everything off with Rosa Parks. But she uh, was following on the heels of Claudette Colvin, who had already uh, sat in, but, they, but Claudette, was following on the heels of the Baton Rouge. That's where I am right this moment. The Baton Rouge boycott was the first of uh, the, the big, you know, mass movements by blacks to boycott for uh, public accommodations, and and they sat in and they did, uh, and they refused to work. They did a lot of the same things that Montgomery would become more famous for because Baton Rouge didn't have the eloquence of a Dr. Martin Luther King, the beauty of a Rose of Parks, to you know, to really be the frontline leaders. Uh, so that's why that movement's not known, but it was really one of the first, not the only one. There's so many stories going back, even pre-Civil War, of Blacks you know, uh, using our collective power uh, to boycott and demand change. Uh, but I love you know, the 60s movement because this is where John Lewis is born. And this is where he will come in and we're gonna pick him up later in this presentation. But uh, Jim Lawson was out there, James Lawson, training people, Daryl, to, uh, and CTV. Vivian, all of these amazing leaders who come up in this period, they're young people in that time who are training each other to, for nonviolence and training each other to be involved and to uh, make change. And remember, um, when we talk about HBCUs, they didn't just come away, come up from nowhere, everybody. Again, as we mentioned in some of our prior um presentations that in uh, immediately following the Civil War, you had four plus million free people who had been in slavery and for 90% of them, their states had, pro had prohibited, uh, made illegal, made criminal the teaching and the education of uh, people who were quote enslaved, and so when so the biggest movement that is led by blacks uh, who join up with Norton whites and a whole lot of you know money and other people is to build the HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities. That is their heyday. That they're built, you know, largely not. You know, uh, you know, largely in that period of 1865 through 1900 is the heyday of the building of the HBCUs and and the religious denominations we talked about last week. The Black Church had a lot to do with the establishment of the HBCUs, but they also become the ground because these are our black kids in the 1960s they become the grounds for fighting for social change and social justice next slide 
All right. Now, before we get here, uh, Naya, I know, uh, you know, that this is some history that you've heard about, about the HBCUs, and you went to an HBCU. And remember that in Invisible Man, uh, that is written, uh, you know, about, uh, that starts off with the, with, uh, with the uh, HBCUs, uh, uh, you know, at Tuskegee, Tuskegee, and says that he couldn't figure out the veil was being put over or taken off of the Black person, uh, and said that, you know, that the, uh, talking about how much uh, some of the history of the HBCUs was to keep Blacks from being activists was to train Blacks to be more accommodating and more uh, uh, accepting of the segregation and the other problems and that the HBCUs were not always, uh, you know, uh, training grounds for revolution, that in fact, uh, what would happen in the 60s was a, a counter to what had been the long history of HBCUs, which was the quote, civilize you know, Blacks. What do you think, Anaya? Well, um, you guys know my history and relationship with my school, Howard University. <laughs> um, well, I, um, I can definitely attest to that. I think that HBCUs um, are definitely a place for um, Black students to prevail when it comes to higher education. I do want to um, recognize and respect that power in which HBCUs hold. But would I say that attending a HBCU is equivalent to liberating um, Black youth? No, um, because the reality of the matter is, you know, um, HBCU is still an institution and a lot of our HBCUs are still funded by um, white people and corporations. And at the end of the day, there are certain guidelines and certain things, um, certain lines that cannot be crossed um, when it comes to even the, the things that we are taught at um, HBCUs. So though we do have more, you know, access to African diaspora studies, um, though we have more access and are um, taught more by Black teachers, um, there is still education that has to be found elsewhere, outside and beyond the classroom, even when you go to HBCU. Um, and really the, the fundamentals and the things that were taught at HBCUs Honestly, in my opinion, Black people need to be taught between the ages of kindergarten, you know, through fifth grade, through zero and, and 10 years old, you feel me? So I feel like it's really like fundamental things. But aside from that, um, when it comes to the movement space, you don't have a, a you know, um, direct action organizing one-on-one -on -one course. You know, you don't have a, you know, from the classroom to the front lines course. There's things that aren't going to be taught uh, because of what it can do even on a college campus. There's things that's not taught because then that means that students will start to be liberated and see the inequities that they face even on a day-to-day -day basis on their, own, um, on their own campuses. And that's something that um, even, you know, administration on um, HBCU campuses don't want. So I do think that it is, um, there are pros and cons when it comes to attending an HBCU. Um, there is a certain level of naivety that is taken off of students once they start attending HBCU, I feel. Um, there's a certain picture that's painted before you go, once you go to the college tour, the campus tour, and there's a picture, you know, that's painted for you on what to expect. And then you get there and sometimes, you know, even those that are being paid to um, speak on your behalf and to fight on your behalf um, aren't doing so. Um, and so that's when you have to go beyond the yard. That's when you have to go beyond the dorms. That's when you have to go beyond, you know, the student body. And that's a okay. great point, Anaya, because what we know that, that, that develops from many of the HBCUs uh, is the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, where we right. have students that are coming together to, very, to do the very thing that you've just discussed, and that is to directly address social issues uh, that are dealing with the African-American population. And Barbara, I know that you wanted to go more deeply into SNCC uh, and, the, and the foundation of SNCC and some of the things that, that SNCC has, has taken on. And it's really yep. interesting because when we start that SNCC conversation, we're gonna end up going to that Nashville student movement piece as well and what, what comes from there. So Barbara, let me yield to you on, on the SNCC. 
yes, you know, Anaya, sometimes it's always back to the future, right? Uh, because, you know, SNCC uh, is uh, founded by Ella Baker, who uh, at Shaw University, by the way, everybody, in 1960, that um, March, you know, of 1960 through that summer. And Ella Baker, you know, it's this black woman genius, you know, amazing leader. You got to read uh, Barbara Ransby's book. That's R-A-N-S-B-Y's book on her, uh, on Ella Baker, The Making of a Revolutionary. And what you're going to find out about her is that uh, she was raised, you know, in all these strict uh, confines. Everybody thought, of course, she would do the only thing they wanted Black women to do back then, which was uh, become a school teacher. Uh, and she decided that she wanted to be more. Uh, and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, she wanted to teach, but she wanted to teach in a different way. And that she also thought it was time for change and more greater equality for women was something she believed in very strongly. And so she, uh, but she also believed in social activism and she ended up at uh, SCLC with doc, working with Dr. King, the student, I'm sorry, the Chris, Southern Christian Leadership uh, Conference, uh, working with um, uh, working with Dr. King. And she became a, little, a lot of disillusioned because of the way that the NAACP and all the mainstream organizations were uh, operating, that she saw that they weren't being as militant as uh, confrontational and that they weren't working with the grassroots and at the grassroots level to make, and that they weren't supporting direct action and promoting direct action the way they should. So she created, uh, she helped to call together uh, a lot of young people. She had been doing that in New York and she brought together uh, all these young people for a conference at Shaw University. And out of that conference, SNCC was created. Uh, so, you know, Shaw University being one of the leading HBCUs. And uh, one of the things, next slide, one of the things that she um, uh, talked to, you know, Diane Nash and Bob Moses and uh, Charles Sherrard and uh, Charles McGee, uh, Medu, who was one of the first chairmen of SNCC, uh, is that she worked with them to really build a different kind of movement. And the movement, uh, and she purposefully worked with them to make sure that they, that they were independent of SCLC, independent of the NAACP, because the mainstream organizations were too conservative and too unwilling to, uh, as uh, Anaya was saying, to challenge uh, the uh, the, leaders, uh, the leadership of the current uh, times. Uh, so it says a lot that these issues of independence, of grassroots organizing, of direct action, those same issues dominate our movement today, Daryl. They're not new, They're, and um, and it's mainly because that's the structure of the you know white structural racism is to defend itself uh, constantly, and it uh, and it you know subverts uh, all kinds of institutions to make that happen, or it builds institutions uh, to make that sure that it maintains its power structure. So moving on to the next slide, <clears throat> John Lewis, gonna start there. Sure, Barbara. And you know, uh, we know that John Lewis uh, uh, was one of the uh, uh, directors of, of SNCC and, and you know, just his in incredible history of, of what he's meant to the movement. Uh, we have his quote up there that get in good trouble, necessary trouble and help redeem the soul of America. But one of the things that, uh, that folks, Barbara, sometimes miss is that whether we're talking about Diane Nash or if we're talking about Bob Moses or McDo or many of the other leaders, uh, they didn't begin with SNCC, right? We know that right. they went back to the Nashville student movement and Nashville was one of a hotbed of, of, of racist activities. And James Lawson was one of the people that was teaching the Diane uh, Nash's, the John Lewis's, the whole nonviolent technique and understanding the power uh, of nonviolence. Right. What becomes really interesting, I think, is when we're dealing with uh, that movement, that, that initial movement, the, uh, the Nashville student movement, that there came a point in time 
when uh, the Freedom Riders, those that were going down into the South to register Blacks to vote and risking their lives, that CORE was one of the organizations that was sponsoring a lot of the Freedom Riders. But there came a time when CORE said it was too dangerous, that they were no longer going to do the Freedom Rides because there's too many uh, threats on the lives of people, uh, the Black folks that were going down there and white folks that were going down there to register people in the South to vote. But what happened? The Freedom Riders didn't stop. The Nashville student movement, John Lewis's group said, no, we're going to continue with these freedom rides. And they believed that the freedom rides were necessary because if they discontinued the freedom rides because of the threats of violence that were going on and directed toward those going down there to register uh, black people to vote, that then the belief would be that uh, violence works to sequel, to stop, to, to suppress those that are going out there to register blacks to vote. And so you had organizations such as the uh, Nashville Student Movement that picked up the baton and said, we will continue with the freedom rides and going down, going down to register voters. And, and that's just a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, experience. Again, as we've intertwined everything in here, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the Nashville Student Movement and those that were involved, you, know, you still had the universities that were involved. You had FIST that was going on down there. You had Meharry in Tennessee that was going on and the Tennessee Agri uh, Agriculture and Industrial School that was going on. So all of that was happening. And John Lewis was at the, at, the, at the middle of it. And the story that Barbara and I love to tell, that I enjoy especially telling with John Lewis, is most people uh, remember him with the Edmund Pettus Bridge. But what they do not remember is that what, as part of SNCC, that SNCC forbid him to lead that march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. But young John Lewis said, they are assembled, they are there, they want me there. I understand you don't want me to go, you've directed me to go, that you forbid me to go, I'm going and I'm leading. And that's the type of leadership that has come out of organizations such as SNCC, organizations such as the uh, Nashville Student uh, Movement. That's the type of leadership that John Lewis has demonstrated to all of us. He was also one of the youngest speakers uh, at the March on Washington in 63. And Barbara, I want you to tell the story that you love, love to tell with regards to how he became that speaker. Well, there's so much that, you know, uh, he only becomes that speaker because Dorothy Height gives up her her opportunity to speak. You know, everybody talks about the fact that there were no women who really spoke at that movement uh, at that 1963 gathering. Uh, Dorothy Height was one of the women. There were like four black women who were uh, possible speakers. Marilee Evers got diverted and couldn't get into town. Uh, Dorothy Height uh, was there. And when they said that they weren't gonna let John Lewis speak, she said, no, a youth voice is more important than my voice. And she gave up her speech, her seat. Now, I don't think that there, there ever should have been such a choice made. And, uh, and that black women not being represented in that um, event has been a, a historic intersectional failure. Uh, but it was really critical that, uh, that John Lewis also was able to be there. So moving on to the next slide, because uh, I want to, you know, try to get through this. And then just more of these incredible leaders, uh, Bernard Lafayette, uh, Diane Nash, et cetera, moving on to the next slide. Uh, and just, you know, talking about people like James Meredith and others, uh, 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 we uh, got that. And then, uh, you know, the sit-ins, uh, you know, uh, the result of all this student activism was the passage of all of these uh, Voting the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, desegregation of schools, etc. And now we're into a new era where uh, young people now have the power. Uh, we see how in this slide how young people increased their participation in 2016, uh, from 2016 to 2020, uh, that now 50, it's estimated almost 55% of all young people voted in uh, 2020. Uh, that's a huge change. Uh, and you see that, uh, you know, more graphics, more charts showing uh, college age voters, what they're doing, how they're making a change. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, again, this slide is harder to read everybody, but it's a turnout uh, slide. And it's 
just again showing the amazing uh, participation of young people. And Daryl will tell you, and Anaya knows too, that when we would ask young people, why are they voting? They would say, because of Ahmaud Arbery because of Breonna Taylor, because of George Floyd, because of wanting to get rid of student debt. Now have these politicians delivered on all of that? Another story, uh, which we're gonna talk about in our next, uh, uh, you know, not today, but in our next presentation is about how do you hold uh, politicians accountable? How do you really make change happen beyond the vote? We're gonna talk about that. Uh, but you can see, you know, again, here's just a list of what young people did, that they uh, talked to others to be involved, that they donated money, that they attended uh, meetings uh, and demonstrations, that they registered others to vote, that they volunteered for political campaigns, et cetera. You can see the activism and a look at the change between 2018, just in two years to 2020. Moving to the next slide. Uh, more, more of the slides on young people activism, more showing uh, how people did, uh, what they did and how they acted and what they uh, undertook. Next slide. Where do we go from here? Where do we go to from here? Next slide. Moving forward. Uh, here's what we can do. And Anaya, do you want to take this slide to talk through it? Um, I definitely can. Um, okay, so yeah, moving forward. Um, listening to learn what they think is important. Okay, I'm thinking they, as in us, as in this right, generation. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> change that language yes go ahead yeah so um it definitely is important um i think it's very vital to listen i think that um change will only come tangible and sustaining change will only come with um intergenerational um conversations and intergenerational movements um so i think we are approaching a day and age in which um generations and those with more experience and more time um, into the in the movement um, are starting to realize like the importance of including the um, the student voice. Uh, I think there was a time in which it was harder um, for the baton to be passed to students and not just to students, but to the youth in general. But I think that right now we're at a point where we are um, working together to not only get the wisdom from those that have been doing the work longer, but also those around my age um, and younger, um, because both of our voices are extremely vital when it comes to this fight. Um, education is extremely important as well, um, especially um, to my generation. And I would charge those that expect for, uh, or expect to use my generation while, you know, um, organizing to get voters um, or to get citizens to register to vote and to go out to vote before having us go out to um, help, but to have trainings on and educating us on the importance of, of, of voting, educating us on the history of voting, um, because not only does it inform us on the current fight right now, but it'll serve as a motivation and um, make us go harder on the front lines when it comes to advocating for voting rights. Um, from knowing how far we've come, the strides that we've made when it comes to voting um, as a people and creating opportunities for us to get involved. Ex exactly. Um, I think that opportunities, um, we need to definitely define what opportunities look like on a larger scale. Yes. Um, you know, it, um, it isn't just us being foot soldiers. We are so much more than that. Um, we are yes. so much more than, you know, having a clipboard and getting people to sign up. Um, yep. But I think, you know, elaborating and giving us more variety when it comes to opportunities and places in which, you know, we can we can level up um, a sustainable opportunity in which we can stay plugged in um, even after um, elections. Thank and, you know, as we go to the next slide, Lynn, uh, the most interesting part of, of this slide, I think, is this, Barbara, is that we know that the young voters have the potential to really make an, an impression, a dent, a difference in the voting uh, throughout our country. That 50% in, in 2020, 50% of the eligible voters uh, under the age of 30 
voted, right? And that was a 39% increase from 2016. And we also know that going into 2022 and 2024, by 2024, that the, uh, that the youth vote will be, uh, will for the first time overtake the over 60 uh, bracket yeah. people that are voting. So the, the potential for dominance in that political spectrum is high. The big piece to it will be certain, uh, will be certain to continue to push on the issues that are uh, of importance to our young voters. Barbara, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything to that before we go to our next slide. Well, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, student loan debt, uh, workplace equity, uh, inequality problems. Uh, I was shocked. Uh, I don't know if people are aware, but in the, uh, and I shouldn't say shocked, I was just pissed, uh, probably is a better word, <laughs> that uh, recently in a debate about uh, having more equity in Pennsylvania for the schools because of the cruelty, the absolute uh, inhumanity of the way that uh, black student uh, schools are, you know, being led or I mean, being uh, funded in uh, Philadelphia. That a guy actually testified that you didn't need all schools to be great. You didn't need all people to have an opportunity to go to college because we need people to be on what he called the McDonald track. Uh, and he talked about those students who only should be on the McDonald track and that the McDonald track was there for those who would always be low wage workers and that uh, and that you if you made too many people too educated, they wouldn't want to be in the McDonald's uh, workforce and that that wasn't acceptable. So we got those issues uh, going on and we know that you know free college tuition is huge and he was of course speaking against that, but we also know that climate change has been a huge issue because that is everything about whether or not there is a future for humanity if we don't uh, you know, solve our client uh, difficulties. Next slide really quickly um, uh, as we're wrapping up. Um, is that it? Uh, next slide. Is that it? All right. Uh, no, I didn't think so. Uh, but this is just a reminder of some of the actions that people have been doing. There's Daryl and I at the Unpack, and look at Daryl getting arrested again, uh, which is something he's become a specialist at, <laughs> along with uh, you know many others. But we believe in direct action and. Uh, we know that HBCUs will continue to be on the front line. I want people to know something. I went to a PWI. My entire educational experience out of high school was predominantly white institutions. And I don't want people to get it twisted. HBCUs have problems, serious problems. PWIs are like slaughterhouses for some black folks. You know, my class that I entered in uh, there were uh, eight of us who entered scripts. Only two of us probably finished uh, out of that class. So I don't want people to get confused that, you know, when I went into Duke, there were um, Black women in my class. Uh, there were like um, possibly, you know, six of us. Only two of us ended. Uh, in at the same university. Now, one transferred and others just quit. Uh, so I don't want people to, you know, the under, to, to underestimate the power of HBCUs uh, to also, um, you know, to, to counter that kind of racism that we encountered in school and that I see, you know, people writing about every day on Twitter and every other experience that a lot of those problems still exist. So, you know, the student experience is a hard one. Um, but Anaya, you said something so important, the importance of independent study. You know, when I would not be who I was, who I am today, if I just took all my instruction from scripts, I had to, you know, learn to read outside, to study with activists, to go to meetings, to, you know, become involved, uh, to form myself, because otherwise uh, that wasn't available. And I know a lot of people listening uh, would say the same thing that we always tell. And that's why we're working 
That's why we have this institute is to create other spaces for knowledge and sharing and building. And I know we're over, but there's just so much here to do. And I was laughing to myself, Daryl, I said, we could have done this in two parts, huh? Uh, there was so much to cover uh, in this particular uh, session, but I am so glad that we've been able to do it. Uh, next slide. <sighs> Uh, yes, and this is uh, just from two weeks ago, three weeks ago in Selma. Look at these young people turning it out with young, uh, with the uh, Black Voters Matters uh, crew. Uh, and I thought it was fascinating that on that entire Selma to Montgomery march, uh, Naya, because you were there, I thought it was fascinating that yes, the young yes. largest turnout, right? Yes, it was. We came. We came in numbers. If it's a party, if it's a, if it's a fight, we are gonna be there. <laughs> look at and but and look at folks. They were tearing it up. I mean, it was it was it was uh, activism and it was serious. And one woman really made us all cry. A young black woman who said that at her school she was the only activist. Uh, who, uh, you know, who was really out there trying to organize people and she had gotten so discouraged, so depressed uh, by the lack of response, but that being in that march, having, you know, uh, come to the march, having work, you know, talk to people on the buses and working with folks, that she, she said that it gave her life, that she was renewed. Her spirit was awakened and, again and, and fed and that uh, she had us in tears and because she was crying and that this was an important turning point in her life. And it's just a reminder how isolated you can become as an activist. Don't ever let that happen. You know, tweet me up, honey, write me. I'm gonna be there for you because I've been there. I've been that ghost on the campus uh, who was the only person you know, talking. And then all of a sudden people coming to awareness and coming back and, and getting active again. I've seen it, these cycles that we go through. And so it's so important folks, you know, let's uh, remember to always invest in our youth. Next slide. And these are just the usual ways that people can get involved and, uh, you know, and there are so many new ways too. Uh, you see all of those different uh, avenues of, uh, of involvement, uh, you know, range, marches, protests, voter education, uh, voter registration, uh, seven, uh, 17 year olds registering, uh, assist with um, citizens, um, uh, who have been negatively impacted by the criminal justice system, the restoration of the right to vote for people, uh, voter case, candlelight vigils, uh, you know, and artistic engagement. Every time we do one of these shows, we have Chris Matthews, you know, uh, called them in song. We need our artists out there, you know, with their poetry, with their uh, art, with their drawings, their paintings, their, uh, their illustrations illustrations of what it is to be an activist at this time. Next slide. Okay, Daryl. <laughs> and you know, this is the big basketball weekend here in, in New Orleans for the final four. And you know, but for us, it's not just about uh, the basketball weekend. We've teamed up with the uh, HBCU All-Star Classic that's is gonna be held on, uh, on Sunday here in New Orleans. And what the whole focus is for us here is that they're now becoming engaged and involved in the social rights, the voting rights movement. And they've had a panel discussion to talk about simply that, how they can become more involved, how they can become more engaged. So folks, you know, we, we encourage everyone to use every opportunity to encourage people to learn more about the voting rights, to learn more about social rights, and to learn more about how they can become involved and to get involved. We encourage folks to go to the tjcoalition.org website. Now, more information about what we're doing, you can go to our votingrightsalliance.org website. And you can also go to faithforblacklives.com, the faithforblacklives.com, where Reverend Stephen Green, who's down here and has been down here with us in New Orleans, uh, encouraging yeah. these, uh, these Black college athletes to get involved, to become a part of it as well. I encourage you to yeah. go to whatever forum best fits you. 
that will uh, enable you to be able to encourage people to register and to become active and become activists across this country. Barbara? Yes, and I want people to know that, um, you know, on Monday, April 4th, uh, that will be uh, the day that the Senate Judiciary Committee will vote on whether or not to send uh, Judge Katanji Brown's uh, Jackson's nomination to the uh, floor for a vote by the entire Senate. Uh, and we're asking people to be involved. But if you haven't read Daryl's piece, Daryl Jones took that pen and he did his thing. Uh, our thing, as people like to say, and he absolutely, uh, you know, wrote a gorgeous ode to black women and uh, and an encouragement letter to all black women. And you should see it. It is called uh, "Preserve." To what is it? To preserve through troubled seas. Persevere. Right Persevere. All right, persevere through trouble seas. I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, to persevere that we got to, because it's from her story, of course, about the woman who stopped her on the campus in, uh, at, at Harvard and said, because uh, she could just tell how down she was feeling and said, persevere, persevere, persevere. But Daryl talks about the hornets and the bees and about everybody becoming a hornet in these times and not to be a bee. Um, and uh, you know that's not saying that you shouldn't make honey, but he's talking about the the stinging when people are you know under attack and uh, how we fight back and how we win, and um, and that uh, what reminds me of one other thing. I just want people to know that of course TJC will be involved and has been involved in that fight. Uh, I've been involved in the fight to get a black woman on court for decades. It's not something new, you know. Now, that's why I got banned from the White House was because uh, I you know, uh, was so, so adamant uh, during the Obama administration about a black woman being on the court. But I also want people to know that we will be doing our trainings that Anaya talked about when she said there's a need for people to really train you uh, to be involved because we're not just about the foot soldiers because foot soldiers are, in, are critical absolutely critical. No movement can exist without them. We also need leadership and young people must be in the leadership. That's why SNCC was important. That's why the live movement is important. It's about youth leadership. Uh, and, and that means their intellectual care, uh, quality, their organizing contributions, all of that is what we need. So we are going to be having our institutes uh, where we actually do our training of nothing but young folks. We train 300 people to beforehand. And Anaya, you haven't had the pleasure of being part of one of our cohorts, uh, but uh, we're planning another one uh, for May. Uh, so we're, you know, in that training uh, right now, uh, planning. So I'm hoping that we can announce that date on our next uh, session, and people can become involved. Uh, Daryl and Anaya, as we close. Thanks so much, Barbara. Anaya, would you like to give us a closing word? Again, it's always a pleasure. To be oh, you're on mute, Anaya. Sorry. Um, Definitely always a pleasure to be um, here amongst family on a Saturday morning. Um, hopefully I will be able to come back and participate in um, the cohort in May. Um, I walk May 7th. So after that, I am free as a bird. Um, <laughs> so um, like I said, always a pleasure. Um, hopefully, you know, people were able to take away what they needed during um, this discussion. Um, there is definitely hope for uh, our people nationwide. Um, it takes discussions like this. It takes, you know, conversations and strategy in order for us to, like I said, move that needle towards true liberation for our people. So truly happy to um, be a part of um, these conversations with you guys, truly. Well, thank you, Anaya. We so enjoyed uh, having you. Again, we encourage you to go to tjcoalition.org to, to follow us. You can also find the piece that uh, Barbara was making reference to, uh, Persevering Through Troubled Seas, uh, the story and our, our word regarding 
uh, our statement on the uh, confirmation of nomination and confirmation process of Katanji, Judge Kataji Brown Jackson. Uh, with that, I know we have an assignment that's coming from Lynn. She's sitting there patiently waiting. Lynn, I'll turn it back over to you, remembering, and we encourage everybody to get off the sidewalks, get into the streets. Let's be there with the students. Let's be there for the students. Let's be behind the students. Let's be out there protecting and fighting for everyone's right to vote. Lynn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daryl. And a special thank you to Anaya. Um, for coming on with us this morning. Congratulations on your pending upcoming graduation from the Howard University. We just look forward to all that you're going to do um, with your life, with your energy, and with your involvement in the movement. Once again, I want to thank Daryl um, Jones and Barbara Arwine for, again, enlightening us on the past and the present and the future, actually. So your assignment, you know, we can't leave you without giving you something to do. Barbara talked about part of it. You still have time. It's not till April the 4th that the committee will vote to send Judge Kataji Brown Jackson's name to the Senate for a full vote and confirmation. So you have time to contact your senators. You can call them at area code 202 2243121. And that's the switchboard number. You tell them where you live. They'll give you, patch you through to your senator's um, office and tell them you want them to vote to confirm. The second thing is share this information. Don't just take this information and keep it to yourself. This is information that needs to be shared. Find a young person and share it with them. Let them know that there are others out there who are of their age group, who may be even of their mindset, and that there are things that they can do to get involved, that they're not too young to start fighting for themselves. So with that being said, we thank you for your attendance once again, and we will see you at the next session of The Good Trouble Voting Rights Institute. Thank you and goodbye. Persevere. Persevere, persevere. Persevere, persevere. <laughs>